Welcome back to The Heat. We're discussing the impact of globalization. Joining us from London is K.U. Jin, a tenured professor with the London School of Economics from the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C. We're joined by senior fellow Chad Bowne. And here with us in the studio is Nancy Birdsell. Nancy is the president of the Center for Global Development and the author of The Development Agenda as a Global Social Contract. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Kayu, let me start with you. No doubt that globalization has played a big role in improving people's lives around the world. But let's look at another side of this, and let's take China as an example. Peking University produced a report in January of this year, and it said that the country's richest 1% own one-third of the country's wealth. So when we look at a figure like that, can we consider globalization a success story for everybody in China? Um, well, I think uh, there is uh, a slight misunderstanding about the impact of globalization on inequality per se and uh, what aspect of inequality. So there's still a huge debate about that. Um, we know that there are other things like technology, technological development that has also have massively influenced inequality. So uh, blaming globalization per se is, you know, a slightly tricky subject. But when it comes back to China, I think that globalization and trade has um, really lifted, um, you know, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty uh, has contributed to that because of, of the growth. So when you have China that had a very small domestic market in the beginning stages in the late 1970s, by opening up to the rest of the world, effectively, China could be the factory of the world, which meant that um, the surplus labor could be employed and infrastructure could be built and people's, you know, that jump, jump started new development. So in the case of China, at that point, over this course of development, trade has actually reduced well, let's say brought about um, uh, kind of wealth for, for a large uh, a population. And I think today's 1% in China is not there because of trade. Chad, when we look at this phenomenon of globalization with uh, trade barriers falling, investment barriers falling as companies invest in other countries, is it happening on a level playing field uh, or do developing countries find it, find it more difficult to compete with developed countries? Well, uh, it's certainly the case that countries liberalized at different points in time. So, you know, the, the richer high-income countries, they were amongst the first to liberalize their economies by reducing uh, tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers, back beginning in the 1940s, really at the end of the Second World War. And at that point in time, many of the now major emerging markets just weren't interested in globalization. You know, China, India, Brazil, they pursued very different uh, economic development strategies. It didn't involve opening up their economies to trade. And it wasn't until really the 1970s, 80s, and early 1990s that these countries decided to start opening up their economies to trade and international in investment and to take advantage of globalization for their, for their economic development strategies. So those types of countries have actually been the latest and the last to open up. Uh, and when you look at trade barriers around the world, perhaps surprisingly, it's still most of the emerging markets in, in developing countries that have the highest trade barriers uh, to get rid of still. And those countries you mentioned, Chad, that opened up uh, their markets, countries like China, India, what prompted that change in the early 80s? Well, I think it was a combination of factors, and, and sometimes it you know, was dependent on the country's own situation. So you know, China uh, made the decision in the 1970s to start opening up uh, and, and pursue you know, its, its strategy. For the case of India, uh, it went through a major negative macroeconomic crisis in the early 1990s, uh, and one of the conditions of receiving assistance from the international community uh, was that it was asked to, you know, reform a number of policies. Some of that included trade and investment. Uh, and that, I think some of the reformers in India used that opportunity to change their overall development strategy and, and point toward a more uh, outward-oriented path. Right, Nancy, let's look at China again. We had a World Bank report uh, that said that China had lifted 500 million people out of poverty since 1981. That is not an insignificant achievement. Uh, poverty levels in 1981, 88%, reduced to 6.5% by 2012. What role did globalization play in this achievement? Oh, absolutely a huge role, as colleagues have already indicated. Uh, the opening up of China, the, the idea of integration of trade and capital markets made a huge difference. 
Uh, so there's a sense in which globalization has been very good for the world's poor. It's been very good for some of the world's initially poorest countries. But we may be at a different conjunction now. Uh, we see that there's a resistance in the West. It's true that it shouldn't be necessarily to open markets. It's because a lot of what has brought problems in the Western, in the US and in Europe is the techno technological change. But there's, it's also true that open markets carry technological change more quickly around the world. So it's not always exactly right to distinguish so sharply between the effects of the global market and the effects of technological change. So we're at a very interesting moment kind of in the future. It's true, I would say the developing countries have a continuing strong interest in staying or getting more integrated into global markets. Uh, the Western countries, we're at a moment when it's not so clear that there's a, an openness to continuing to stay open. All right, what's your view on that, Kayu, that there's reluctance on the part of developed countries and uh, more uh, enthusiasm, let's say, on the part of developing countries? Yes, well, first of all, um, an observation or comment I'd like to make, uh, which I think um, is, um, is an important one to, to make about China and China's impact on uh, the world, especially, you know, after we're hearing about, uh, uh, about so much of the negative impact of Chinese trade on, uh, in America. Uh, the facts are the following. Uh, it is true that manufacturing employment did decline and that coinc coincided with China's manufacturing exports to the U.S. So there is a sense in which uh, Chinese uh, manufacturing export dis did displace uh, manufacturing workers. That is true. However, there are two major benefits, which I find surprising that never really get brought up, or at least enough, in the conversations or the debates. And the first is it has substantially lowered uh, consumer prices, real consumer prices for Americans. And it happened to be more beneficial for the poor households. Sorry, not just the US, but all of the advanced world. And the reason is that um, the Chinese exports are concentrated in you know, lower end uh, consumer products, including toys, furniture, apparel, et cetera. And the poor consume a higher percentage of their expenditures in, these, uh, in, in Chinese uh, goods. So it actually disproportionately benefited the poor. Chad, one of the reasons we hear that there is um, growing disenchantment with globalization here in the United States is the job market. Uh, we hear complaints in this country that manufacturing jobs have moved. They've moved to places like China. So in that respect, has globalization actually negatively affected the worker in the United States? Well, I think the story there is complicated. Um, as Kay indicated, you know, there, there has been evidence uh, of significant dislocation, displacement in the United States and other advanced economies in the manufacturing sector. Uh, and this has been taking place at the same time that we've seen increased imports from China, from Mexico, and from a host of developing countries. The difficulty is at the same time that's taking place, you have massive technological innovations. And so, you know, when you look at the data for the United States, for example, the United States is still producing as much manufactured output as it ever has. And in fact, it's producing more of it. It's just doing it with fewer and fewer people. And the people that it needs to produce these types of goods are increasingly sophisticated and, and skilled and have access to technology and computers and robots. And what that has meant is a lot of the older jobs, the blue collar jobs, the manufacturing assembly line jobs in the United States that employed a host of Americans 10, 20, 30 years ago, they aren't there anymore. And so the real failure of the United States has been to recognize that, I think, and to develop the kind of public policies that help workers transition to the new future, the 21st century, century economy in the United States, and lose their jobs for any reason, you know, whether it's because of trade uh, or whether it's because of a robot. Uh, we're moving into a new economy, and some of the workforce isn't quite prepared for that yet. And that's really one of the, the reasons why we've seen some of this pushback, especially in the United States. And Nancy, when we look at the movement of labor across the world, is it easier for multinational companies based in advanced countries like the United States to ignore uh, labor standards, workplace standards, environmental standards, use of child labor for that matter, by moving their manufacturing operations to developed country, uh, developing countries? 
Well, it's easier. It's not as easy as it used to be because there's a lot more scrutiny by civil society groups around the world. Um, but I think it's not really getting to the fundamental point about the effects of global markets on developing countries, which on the one hand have been and are very good. On the other hand, even in the U.S., we see that when you have a bigger global market, those who are already endowed with something, whether it's education, whether it's financial assets, whether it's political connections, are better able to capture the benefits of that bigger system. That's true within the U.S. It's true within China, as you said at the beginning. Uh, there's a lot of there is growing inequality within all countries, including developing countries. So there's a fundamental issue, which is that you need some role for a, a, an effective state that's accountable to its citizens in order to create the level playing field that you referred to. And in a sense, developing countries are weaker on the level, sort of political accountability uh, tally than most rich countries. So that's why eventually we're going to see, I think, more and more resistance to global market opening, even though it's absolutely correct that overall it can be a win-win. Is globalization here to stay, or are we going to see people like Donald Trump put up barriers again, withdraw into protectionism? Um, another thing that we, we, we often, often observe is that protectionism tends to heighten when economies are not doing well. So I think so long as the economies are not going to recover, and I don't see any really, you know, I'm not really too optimistic, I think we're going to see the protectionism as a trend going forward. Chad, what is your view on that? Uh, how important is it for countries like the United States to better distribute this newfound wealth to make sure that everybody benefits? Well, I think, I think it's incredibly important. Um, you know, I think that the, the best evidence of that is, is the election that we just saw. Uh, I am worried about protectionism. The other thing that I'm worried about is we're starting to see, you know, even signs, I think, within some of the major beneficiaries of globalization, China, for example, uh, starting to have to go through some of the transitions that the higher income countries are historically have had to go through. And I think Nancy pointed to this. You know, the, the, the Chinese steel industry is a great example. China now produces or has the capacity to produce 50% of the world's steel. But we don't need all of that steel right now in the world. And so China itself is having to scale that back. That means laying off potentially millions of steel workers, just like has happened over the last two to three decades in the United States and in Europe. So even in China, you know, how they make these adjustments in, in their domestic economy to these, to these shifts uh, being induced by globalization are going to be incredibly important as well. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for joining us.